Um, so yeah, like I was saying, uh, show of hands who doesn't know who is eBay, what is eBay. Okay, we got that covered. <laughs> so basically, we are under the umbrella of uh, eBay. Um, eBay Classifieds Group basically focus on local markets, so websites where you can buy and sell all kinds of goods, uh, mostly or within your city or in your own country. So we have these um, 10 brands in multiple countries, um, like in Marktplatz in Netherlands, um, Mobile de uh, in Germany uh, for selling cars, uh, Ebeckland and Zeigen here in Germany, uh, and we have uh, our data centers mostly in uh, Netherlands and uh, Germany. Um, so our cloud is um, basically two regions in those data centers, one in Amsterdam and another in Dusseldorf. These are some of the stats. Um, so yes, yeah, you can see, I'm lying a little bit. It's not totally 80 cores, but almost there. Um, so we have uh, around 40 cores in, in each region, in Amsterdam and Dusseldorf. Um, 10K instances on Amsterdam, it's our, it's our bigger, uh, biggest uh, region, and around 6K um, instances in Dusseldorf. Uh, we provide uh, volumes, uh, object storage, um, block storage, um, yeah. I'll come, I'll give it to Adrian. Yeah. So, um, as you know, at the start of this year, we were confronted with a really se serious security bug, um, the Spectre ML down uh, vulnerabilities, and as you can imagine, our security stance uh, needed to be covered. So, you saw that we have a lot of reputable brands, Mobile Day mainly, and eBay clients, again, and then Markplatz. So, um, we decided to immediately or as soon as possible patched against these vulnerabilities. Um, just a quick reminder for you that you don't know what Spectre Meltdown is. So Meltdown um, leaks um, kernel data to user mode programs and Spectre is um, priming the branch predictor of the CPU and can predict what branch is going to be executed next. Um, while Spectre is um, harder to exploit than Meltdown, it's also harder to mitigate. I think there was even this morning an article on Ars Technica where they found uh, seven more uh, bugs. So the gift that keeps on giving. So uh, this is the short um, description of what the vulnerabilities are. And um, in the next slide, I, my colleague is going to talk about so investigating I'll, it. I will talk about our timeline and the phases that we have done for this project. Um, we started, so the project basically started from January this year and ended in July. Um, so there are, basically we started with an assessment phase where we go into uh, investigate what packages we need to patch, um, what we need to do um, for this to be um, covered. Then obviously as soon as we started the project, we started the development, de uh, development phase where it developed all the scripts and automation that we needed to apply these patches. Um, for Dusseldorf, our first cl uh, cloud region that we patched, we took one, one month. In Amsterdam, then we took more than that, like around, yeah, so four months, yes. Um, but in between, we took more time in Amsterdam because we, in, in between, we are confronted with some patches that we need to do in our own infrastructure and I will be talking about more in depth what we, need, what we did in those uh, different phases. My colleague will talk now about the assessment phase. Yeah, so um, 
we were not one of the companies that knew upfront about the, the exploit, so we, we um, got informed with the rest of the world. So we started to understand what uh, mitigating the bug would mean. So for us, um, uh, the, the path that we have chose to take was to update the Linux kernel, uh, update the QEMU KVM, and then updating the BIOS. Um, there were other paths. Uh, we saw that the colleagues from CERN uh, took another path, but we decided that <clears throat> we want to offer maximum stability to our cloud and don't really need to rush into into immediately patching the uh, patching with the microcode. Uh, our CentOS di distribution was already a bit behind, so meanwhile, while, while we took the decision to go the BIOS way and wait for our Dell vendor to provide the stable BIOS, we also uh, had time to develop um, updating CentOS from an older version to um, an older version, skipping one, and then updating to CentOS 7.4, actually. The first mitigations that we actually did were uh, to provide uh, as fast as possible, well, as fast as the distributions uh, released to the public uh, mitigations, and then we built our uh, custom images. We worked with our uh, tenants to test the images, see if they, uh, if they have any performance impact. They didn't, and then we um, launched um, launch internally the, the um, glance images for, for consumption. Um, we, are we, we were pleasantly surprised that CentOS and Red Hat were among the first to have patches for this, so we immediately offered that. And then uh, Ubuntu and Debian uh, soon to follow with um, different repetitions and iterations of the of the, um, of the images. While doing this, we also w w developed our, our strategy, how to patch the, the cloud, and then my colleague is, um, is going, to uh, going to tell you uh, what we um, developed and why. So it was clear that we needed to automate all this big task of just restarting uh, 1,000 hypervisors. So what we uh, decided is to use Ansible as our main tool, and we uh, used heavily Ansible roles, which is a way to organize your tasks. Um, as an example, we have like OpenStack roles, hardware roles, update roles, and the most important, one of the most important ones is the checker role, where you check the Melter Spectre vulnerability. Um, things like uh, resetting the iDrive, restarting the compute, uh, updating the operating system and the BIOS, those are our roles that we could reutilize and organize. I will like deep dive on the meltdown, meltdown spectre, spectre checker role. Um, it's not that uh, rocket science, so basically we check for the patched BIOS, that it is the correct version that, that we need on the hypervisor. We check if there's the correct version of the kernel installed. We check if we have the KMU uh, version that we need, since it's, uh, it provides some CPU bits that you need to, to expose the system calls that, that are new for uh, patching the vulnerability. And then, in the end, we run um, a checker on the host that it's an open source uh, script that basically tests the variants that we, that we want to check. Um, you can even find it on GitHub. Uh, it's a very uh, nice script that covers everything. Like this is a very simple example of a Nansible playbook running where everything went okay, and in the end you can so you can see the the versions that we were testing, um, the SVEs that were mitigated. So it's it's a pretty so you. While you're running, it's pretty easy to detect if everything is all right. Now going like deeper on the playbook that actually patches uh, um, the hypervisor. So I divided this in three uh, main phases. The pre-tasks, where you just uh, prepare the hypervisor for patching, where you disable Puppet, uh, in the, our case, unmount the file system ZFS, um, maybe check the current BIOS, uh, yeah, and stop, obviously, the instances that you are running on the hypervisor. Then the actual update uh, happens where you upgrade the BIOS, 
um, you update the operating system, we are actually upgrading the BIOS um, on the operating system, so that's why it's done before. And then we go to, and onto the post tasks where we reboot compute nodes and we run the checker that I just showed. Um, and if everything is all right, we just start and uh, putting back the hypervisor in the previous state. So mounting the file system, starting the services, starting canaries that I will talk later where they are, starting the VMs and enable the compute node. So as you saw here on this um, patching playbook, there's some things that maybe need cl clarification. So some services were restarted. Um, a very important service that we need to restart is the vRouter engine. So um, in eBay classified group, we are using Contrail for our SDN. So we need to restart our vRouter agents, basically the Contrail component that forwards packets from the VMs. Um, we also have a canary running on every hypervisor that does a little bit of monitoring and testing of the actual hypervisor. Um, and we also were like unmounting and mounting the ZFS file system that we use to host the actual virtual machines. Now Adrian will talk a little bit more of other tasks. Yeah. So um, we are fortunate enough to uh, mainly have um, um, cattle uh, in, in, in our cloud and not necessarily pets. So um, one of the things that we were fortunate enough to do was to actually disable the hypervisor and completely stop all of the VMs. And then our tenants uh, had the choice either to spawn their workload uh, in a different zone or uh, have the downtime with us and then we'll, we are going to just bring up their VMs. Um, so uh, we uh, we didn't use any live migration. That was one of the that was one of the things because uh, we f we uh, thought that live migration is going to um, possibly impact the um, the maintenance. So we wanted to keep it as uh, as simple as possible and then ensure that the VMs are are up again. Um, so. It, we, we had to develop a um, way to keep the list of the VMs running on the on the host, so we didn't do Nova Evacuate. And then, um, actually something very important for us, because we're not living in a perfect world, we had um, broken hypervisors where they are were not suitable for production, but um, they, 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 they were in some sort of pre-maintenance task where we wanted to change uh, some disks or something. And then we wanted to save the disabled reasons uh, for, um, for them. So whenever you do Nova service list, you would see the, why the, that hypervisor was not productive. So we wanted to, to save that, uh, that change, uh, that reason and restore it for future use. Um, the BIOS upgrade, yeah, it was not perfect again. Um, what we actually did, we downloaded the Linux, uh, Linux provided package from, from Dell, and then using Ansible, we executed it locally, parsed the output of the, of the, um, of the script, of the package, and then uh, made the decision if the, um, if the um, operating system is safe to reboot, and after, uh, after that we have uh, rebooted the, um, the hypervisor. There were cases where IDRAC got stuck. Uh, the, uh, part, uh, our, our maintenance didn't have the, the, um, the task to update IDRACs and make sure that IDRACs are fully functional. We just thought that um, as a precaution, we would just reboot the IDRAC and then try the patching again. In, in some cases, again, lessons learned, we had to do the patching manually. Bruno is going to talk about hardware failures. Um, so with all of these uh, reboots that we did in our infrastructure, very often the machines would not come up with, or a BIOS was corrupted and we needed to go directly to the, to the machine and actually install the BIOS. Uh, no network or CPU memory errors. Um, so because when you are booting is actually a, an intensive task that will cause some failures if, if the hardware is not in a good state. So there's always a risk when you reboot that you probably will decrease your, your capacity. Um, I will move now into talking about our testing phase. Uh, a milestone was when I 
said in our um, team chat in Slack, we has meltdown fixed computes, which means we had like a playbook that actually was running all the steps, we had all the versions and it was checking that it's uh, fully uh, patched. We selected some group of users to do this testing, so we, we, dis we didn't patch everything at once, we just added some infrastructure with those patches and see how it behaved. And um, at the same time, we were keeping like an eye on the community to see if uh, there was some um, consequences of, of patching the hypervisors, if the load would increase immensely, because this was one of the people were afraid that this could happen. I will talk a little bit about as well. So while we are doing this, we are restarting all our infrastructure and we use AVI Networks Load Balancer and we needed to do some automation on it. So the way that RV Load Balancer works is that there's some service engines that are basically VMs that are spawned on your, in each tenant and those VMs basically do the load balancing. They are small uh, yeah, load balancers. So, um, we needed to migrate all of those service engines on the zone or rack that we were up upgrading because at, at the point that we, the version that we had, it was not aware of the, of the availability zones. So they were not like spread around on different availability zones, even if we just did the upgrade uh, on that one. Uh, we automated this with uh, AVI Ansible SDK and some Python scripts. So there is a lot of tools to do this as well, which works very, very well. Adrian will talk now about the campaign in Dusseldorf. Yeah. So uh, Dusseldorf, like uh, we said in the beginning, was uh, um, the first data center that we decided to patch. Um, we went the full cloud way, uh, where we told our users uh, that we are going to take down one availability zone per week, and they were fine with that. We never had such um, scale maintenances, so it was a learning curve for us as well. So what we did is for, uh, in a specific day of, um, I think it was a Thursday, we started, we disabled complete zone four. Uh, again, our users could have uh, taken the downtime with us or moved their workloads in the other three uh, um, availability zones. Um, we um, we took all of uh, we took the zone completely down, and then up again, um, patched everything and restored the, the the VMs. We did the same uh, for uh, for zone number three, and then for the last two zones, we we uh, got a bit of momentum, and then we did it did them in the same week. The lessons that we we learned were that yes, we can do it very fast, we can uh, upgrade an entire data center uh, in a few weeks, but there was not that optimal. Our users, uh, so we found, we had feedback from our users that their elastic clusters, um, elastic search clusters were uh, resyncing shards a lot, so if we weren't, um, careful enough on bringing up uh, entire racks that uh, that they had problems with uh, rebalancing their elastic clusters. So uh, for the next campaign in Amsterdam, we took that feedback and then we had another strategy. Um, yeah, so uh, this uh, data center took more time. Uh, we started with the same approach, so um, one, one zone per week, and on the first, first uh, upgrade, we, we had an issue, which is the, we, did, we needed to patch our SDN. I will talk more about on details on how. And that, that happened as well while we did the second zone. So we had two patches in between. That's why it stretched a little bit um, <clears throat> on our target to do it at least in one month. Um, so we started with one zone, one zone per day, and then we, uh, we finished with one rock per day. I will tell you why we did this. Um, so there was two patches that we needed to, that we detect while we were booting. Uh, 
uh, one was related with our Contrail SDN, another with our uh, AVI load balancer as a, as a service. So Contrail has a, um, uh, a comp uh, uses F FMAP, a protocol that distributes configuration from the configuration nodes to the control nodes. <coughs> we needed to apply a patch that basically was catching an exception, and um, yeah, it was delivered by our for, by Juniper Control and Backport. The same happened with the uh, AVI uh, load balancer as a service, where an, an service engine was having trouble in set, setting up a cluster interface, and we also got a, f a fix from AVI to fix the whole and new creation of service engines. So yeah, it took some trouble to do this. Now Adrian will talk a bit a little about the performance. Yeah. So uh, Dusseldorf was our um, test case, our first test case. Um, our German colleagues would um, would know that the this is the elastic search cluster of a uh, reputable website here in Germany, eBay clients, Eigen. And then th the, the lower graph is the hypervisor load uh, before, during, and after, the, after we executed the maintenance. And then above uh, is a bit more detailed um, CPU um, instructions and usage. Again, before, during, and after the maintenance. For this specific use case, which is one of the most important things, so imagine everyone searches for, uh, for the things that they want to buy on eBay clan and second, we see actually no, uh, no impact for us. So everything was more or less in the same limits before uh, and after the um, patching for Spectrum meltdown. So for this example only, we can say that we aren't impacted by the um, uh, by the 10, 15 percent that the community was uh, was saying. Uh, this is the same case for um, for Amsterdam. So uh, this platform is a dual data center platform, and then um, th this is the same observation. Uh, before, uh, during, and after the, our maintenances, we can't clearly uh, have a pattern where where performance got impacted. Yeah, just to go a little bit about, maybe it can be a bit little confusing. There's a lot of noise, at least on the first one. Yeah. Basically, the conclusion is here is like, if uh, there is no change before and after, so they all stay the same. Even if you can see maybe a little bit increase of load, this is just people creating more instances and the hypervisor gets more loaded. So there was no difference between the patches. Uh, I will talk a, a little about about maintenance strategies. Um, so uh, we started with one zone, one zone per week, but then we ended up when, with a rack per day because it looked like a, a good compromise between velocity and impact. Like my, my colleague said, some uh, platforms, which is a group of users for us, were um, kind of uh, afraid that it was impacting too much on their workload. Like, Taking down a whole zone will be too much for them, so we were doing like one rack, one rack per per day. Um, we were also uh, notif uh, notifying which VMs were affected on that uh, rack, so people need to know what's going on. This is something that we need to automate uh, better, and we were as well communicating all the steps to our users. So we use Slack, and we were just giving them updates on what was happening when we were stopping the VMs, when we were updating them, and when everything is finished. Because usually users need, w would want to know like what's happening at what time and when, when they will get the VMs back. So what we have learned. Um, Ansible is a great tool for infrastructure automation, and we encourage everyone to use it with roles or, or any other modules that you can use. Uh, do not rush an updating uh, as soon as a vulnerability is discovered. Try to hold it off until you are sure that the patches are not causing any consequences to your infrastructure, uh, because like that happened where uh, a BIOS update was released 
and then it needed to be uh, pulled out because it was rebooting the servers. And the same with the microcode, it was pulled out and then again, so make sure that uh, what you're patching is really, it's really um, uh, on, on prime. And so I talked about the patches that we did. It's actually good that we restarted our whole infrastructure because you can catch even either hardware failures or catch bugs on it, well, that you only do when you're stressing the, the actual infrastructure. And try to scope the maintenance as uh, the best to reduce impact, like we did from reducing from one whole zone to uh, a small rack. That's it. Uh, questions? I have a question. Uh, regarding that you update your BIOS that you said that you have to, uh, you did it via this in the Linux command line, then you have to reboot server. Uh, how do you deal with these VMs actually on the hypervisor? Are they cloud ready? Or do you have to, uh, did you have to uh, live migrate those VMs before the rebooting? Uh, so, like my colleague said, we just stop them and leave them there, we upgrade, and then we start them. So they stay, they are not migrated. So those applications actually, they are not affected by the rebooting no. or? Yeah, we, we basically uh, instruct our users to replicate their application towards uh, all availability zones so they can uh, be aware of failures. So their apps should be, aw should be um, aware of those failures and cope with them. Thank you. Can I just, oh, sorry, I've got the mic, I'm louder. <laughs> um, just a question, you mentioned in your last uh, slide about lessons learned, um, like restart your whole infrastructure off, and is that something that you currently do, or is that like a, le I mean, well, obviously it's like a lessons learned, so you like implementing something like Chaos Monkey as a result of this to, to sort of, you know, to try and so uh, tackle that? We, yeah, good question. So we don't do that currently, so we are doing it when, right now when it's needed, like a new feature or a new upgrade, but we intend to do it every three months, so we, we are thinking next, next year to come up with a plan to automate all of this. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks very much. Cheers. The, the latter. <laughs> Is there any specific reason for, reason for not using massive live migration? Because you said you did not live migrate except AVI machines. Yeah, so um, we we did a test with our users, um, and then we saw that some of their workloads were uh, negatively affected by, by live migration. So we decided together with them that uh, they should take just the downtime because we have, like, a, like, maybe I didn't mention it correctly, we have four zones in each data center, and then they can still have enough capacity in the other three zones that are up. And um, what we notice also is, depending on the workload, live migrations, uh, maybe 80% of them are, are passing, and then maybe 20% are not correctly live migrated. And then we didn't want to stretch out the, um, uh, the maintenance. We didn't want it to, to be very long. So we wanted to do a zone in one day, uh, ideally. So this is why we didn't want to do uh, live migration. We have pretty beefy nodes, and then live migrating everything was going to take some time, even on 10G. But did you use live migration in a regular basis, or? Um, depends, again. So we, we tend to encourage our users not to, to, tread, uh, to treat their VMs as pets. So we most often tell them either destroy your VM, or we will take it down, or something like that. You're lucky enough to have cloud compliant clients. Yes, <laughs> yes, that, that, that's true, yeah. Hey, um, I saw all the steps, there were seven steps including disabling compute node, dis 
you know, stop services, start services, and patch, and then do the BIOS update. So all these are done in a single Ansible playbook, or you have several playbooks that, that you are yes. achieving so, this through? Yeah, um, it started like that with a big one, mm -hmm. which was easier for our testing, but then we noticed that we needed to split them up. Yeah. So we did some splitting like uh, things that we need to do before, things that we need to do um, only for updating. So we split it and it will actually uh, better because we tried as well to have different uh, team members. So it'd be easier to split the playbooks and they will run specific tasks. So, so the, the, this leads where there is no continuous end-to-end -end patching for a node, right? So you have to wait until one playbook finishes and then start the next one. That's like a manual intervention. Yes, so uh, that will ha it's true, but we can also control it better what's happening. Okay. Uh, we can, so we had the two possibilities. We had this whole playbook that runs everything, but then we, we realized that, so in the, since we had more, we were doing only one zone, that was a lot of hypervisors to patch. So that's why we split it. But then when we moved to a rack-based uh, maintenances, we were, could actually run the whole playbook from, one, from top to bottom. Okay. Yeah, we've been using the same solution, Ansible playbooks, for our patching too, but then uh, we have stitched all our playbooks using our CI-CD deployments, so that is just a trigger, and then it'll notify you if there's something wrong happened during the run. Yeah, that will be the, 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 next, step. the next step and the optimal, yeah. yeah. We, we are... Uh, as well, we want to do that. Yeah, yeah. just a suggestion. Yeah. yeah. One more question. So, for your BIOS update, you mentioned you have um, experienced corruption. Did you figure out what is causing that corruption? Oh, yeah. So, um, basically, for some reason, uh, some of the um, some of the IDRAX were performing poorly. So nothing would help. Um, we did a rack reset, so just basically rebooting the IDRAX. We 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 almost we, we did everything to have, let's say, a stable IDRAX, but none of our uh, none of our things, none of our solutions, um, in the end, gave us 100% uh, stability of the IDRAX operating system. So. The, the next step would have been to actually uh, update the IDRAC firmware and then update BIOS. But again, that would uh, introduce a new dependency in our, so in our path cycle. So you're saying basically just updating the BIOS independent, you leave the other components alone? Correct, correct. We, we, have, oh. we have solutions where we can upgrade uh, every firmware of the, of the compute uh -huh. uh, node, but that was again out of the scope. We wanted to keep it very, very targeted to fixing very fast this uh, vulnerability. So are you downloading those BIOS uh, update from locally to those server or where you update that? Right, get so, uh, so in, the, in the playbook, we basically do a VGET, we uh, place the file on the, on the hypervisor, we execute the Linux binary and then parse the output. Uh, and uh, based on the output, uh, we decide if uh, that compute node is uh, stable to reboot. Mm -hmm. and in, in most of the cases, I think we had just a few cases where corruption occurred. Uh, we were worry? right about, uh, so uh, when about you the. So you downloaded those down BIOS images, you verify those images are good? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 the, so, so the image was 100% uh, correct, the, 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 the Linux binary, and then we applied it. Yeah, sure. Okay. We, we verified that. Yeah. yeah. How do you? How diverse is the hardware you have? Is it 100% Dell or do you have HPEs and Lenovo's? And did you have to write in a custom code for Ansible like modules uh, to deal with some of the BMCs? So um, we have homogeneous hardware from one vendor, from Dell. Um, and no, we didn't uh, have to write any, anything for the BMC. We know. Uh, Later on, while we were doing this project, we saw that there is a Ansible for Redfish that, and that could do what we wanted actually. But our again, our IDRAX were not all at the same level, so 
this is why we didn't went the redfish part. As a later project, after we did the the the, the, the patching, we upgraded all of our IDRAX. So, so now we can use redfish. What we can the wrote <coughs> was a way in a in a Ansible playbook to reset the IDRAX. Mm -hmm. So that will so if it fails, we will run again and. So that sometimes fixes because there's some some jobs that are stuck, yeah. and we resetting them we could up, apply. But in the end, there was some corner cases that we needed to do Actually, it manually. Yeah. 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 I think if there's no more questions, that's it for yeah. us. Thank, Thank you. you.